David was the co-founder of DebateGraph, which is about producing effective argumentation. And that was piloted with the Prime Minister's office and is being used by the Independent European Commission. And I believe the talk is on thinking deeply together. That's great. Thank you. Uh, following on from Jonathan's talk, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you what I've been fiddling with over the last few years. And uh, 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 also uh, for questions afterwards and uh, if you grab me after, uh, after the end of the, uh, the lecture as well, uh, think about what I'm about to describe through the lens uh, that Jonathan was describing. I'd be very interested to get your, uh, your feedback on that. So I'm going to start with a story. Sorry about that. Now I'll start with the story. Uh, so uh, in 2006, Banksy, uh, the uh, British graffiti artist, held his first show in Los Angeles. Uh, he um, uh, rented out a warehouse, uh, and as uh, one of the exhibitions, one of the centerpieces or corner pieces of it, um, he created a mock living room uh, and uh, with uh, uh, and took a, uh, an elephant, a 38-year-old uh, Indian elephant called Thai, painted Thai to match the wallpaper in the room with fleur de lis, uh, and uh, put it there uh, for people to come and look at. And the uh, Banksy's reasoning for this was uh, he described it as follows. The show is about the elephant in the room, the problems that we don't talk about, the fact that 10 billion people live below the poverty line. Uh, he has a, uh, an artist's eye for uh, numbers. Uh, the fact that 1.7 billion people have no access to clean drinking water, and the fact that 800 million people are sick to the death of artists telling them what a bad place the world is without actually ever doing anything about it. Uh, so a statement uh, on one level about global poverty uh, and the, the endemic and systemic nature of it. Uh, of course, though, if you put, uh, as Lakoff will tell you, if you put an elephant in a room or ask people not to think about an elephant, the first thing that will happen is that people start to think about the elephant. Uh, and so uh, some of the reaction around this event, uh, the Los Angeles Animal Services Department had had to give a, a, a license for uh, tie the elephant to be used as part of the process. Uh, and when they discovered exactly how it was being used, that it had been painted in this way, uh, their response to the event was, it sends a very wrong message that abusing animals is not only okay, uh, it's an art form. Uh, permits will not be issued for such frivolous abuse of uh, animals in the future. So a very different uh, take or perspective on uh, a, a statement, perhaps, about uh, global poverty. Uh, third perspective uh, on this was by uh, Carrie Johnson, who was the owner of uh, Thai and uh, of her company, Half Trunk Will Travel. Uh, she said Thai didn't really know what the fuss was about. She said, Thai has done many movies. Uh, she's used to makeup. Uh, Thai was unavailable for comment, although I believe that uh, she has a deal with Max Clifford uh, now, and uh, we'll be following up with that. Uh, so... Of course, for many of you, and uh, this is a fairly hackneyed uh, example, I guess, in this, uh, this environment of the, uh, of the six blind men and uh, the elephant. Uh, anyone in here not, uh, not heard this bef before? Okay, for, as there are a few hands, uh, it's, a, it's a poem about uh, six blind men who uh, go out to, to try and identify this object that's before them. Uh, one of them feels the elephant's uh, tusk and, uh, and concludes the elephant's a sphere. One of them uh, feels the elephant's uh, uh, trunk and concludes that it's a snake. One feels the elephant's ear and, and, and it says it's a fan. One feels the side of the elephant and says it's a wall. One feels the legs of the elephant and says it's a tree trunk. Uh, and one of them uh, feels the tail and says it's a rope. Uh, and the key part of this, as the, as the poem ends, is, and so these men of Indostan disputed loud and long, each in their own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong. Though each was partly right, all were in the wrong. And when we face, uh, uh, when we're starting to deal with the complexity, the non-linear, messy problems that we face in uh, public policy and in many other fields at the moment, the challenge is, of course, that it's not just one elephant uh, that we're dealing with, uh, and it's not uh, one room, uh, and there are many people uh, and many different perspectives. And so 
we're left feeling with the situation uh, that's a little bit like uh, in, in the Menger sponge, uh, an infinite surface area that contains no volume, uh, trying to understand and how we can act in this in, uh, environment. And all the time, uh, the elephants of uh, global poverty, climate change, hunger, all of the things that uh, uh, are perhaps embodied in the, the statement that Banksy was making are present uh, there. And so beginning to think, how do you begin to cope with that? How do we deal with these uh, new kinds of systemic challenges that, uh, uh, that we're facing? And of course, the problem's not getting any easier. Uh, this is a map of the, uh, the information pathways of the internet in January uh, 2009 by uh, Bell Labs, uh, showing the way that the, uh, the information flows through the internet and this explosion of information uh, that we're experiencing at the moment. And of course, we see the internet through different sorts of lenses, but uh, the social media, the, uh, uh, the, the conversations that are flowing around this, uh, again, the tremendous bustling of uh, information and, uh, uh, and information overload, and how, how you begin to focus and exist within this environment is, is one, of the, one of the key uh, things that I want to explore. So how do we deal with it? Well, uh, one of the challenges for us is that um, uh, as uh, from Burt, Burt Norton, uh, humankind cannot bear very much reality. Uh, and this is not meant to disparage Twitter, which is a fantastic uh, system for sharing and serendipitous discovery of uh, information and social, uh, social conversation. Uh, but how, when we're confronted with this complexity, with uh, all of the information signals building, with problems that, uh, uh, that draw and influence uh, in uh, many people in many different in interconnected ways. How do we begin to approach that? Uh, various strategies, familiar strategies, uh, not ones on Jonathan's list, I think, but uh, head in the sand, uh, management by walking around, uh, or opting for lives of quiet desperation. And what I, th I think and what other people uh, that I'm working with in, in, in the field see is that there's a new opportunity emerging which is that we've had, and it's not really to scale because the, the gray and the blue would be far bigger, but uh, the, uh, we've had this tremendous proliferation of, of growth and the, uh, of information and the ability to uh, analyze that uh, and information and discover things from it. Uh, and that was really with, uh, with building that with the first wave of the web. And the second wave of the web is layering a social graph uh, uh, on top of that. It's the networks, uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, all the other things that embody that. But also the conversations that are flowing through those networks uh, uh, on blogs and, uh, and other places as well. Uh, but the real opportunity, the real thing which the technology is beginning to open up to us is this third small piece at the, uh, at the top, which is the ability to... Uh, structure meaning collectively and to uh, lead to coherent action uh, with that. Uh, and so the opportunity that's emerging with the internet now uh, and with different visualizations is for the ability for us to network our thought in a really powerful way and in a way which perhaps gives us an ability which we've never had before to capture the complex and respond to the complex surfaces of the, uh, of the public policy problems uh, that, we, that we confront. And so I that was a preamble to talk about uh, and describe what uh, the, the work that I've been engaged in. I, I founded a debate graph with uh, Peter Baldwin, who's a former minister of higher education in uh, the uh, Australian uh, government. Uh, and uh, he retired from politics in the mid-1990s, frustrated at how difficult it was to uh, engage people in nuanced uh, uh, thought, how difficult it is to step outside party political positions, and saw uh, collaborative editing of argument maps on the, on, on the web as one way to, to do this. I came to it uh, from, a, uh, from a very similar perspective of, of concept mapping, working in mediation, working in public policy, seeing how inefficient the existing public consultation process is. Uh, and so the essence of this process is to begin to focus on the, uh, on the ideas that are there, to try and gather the ideas that are dispersed through the community, uh, all of the ideas that are relevant, but to try and do that in a way that rather than representing ideas that appear many times uh, in the flow of conversation, to try and distill them out so that you only represent them once. Uh, 
And what you find is that if you begin to listen to the community, uh, what the, everything that the community has to offer, even with the complex uh, problems uh, like climate change, you begin to find that you get a curve of, uh, as the first uh, contributions uh, are, are coming in, you get a rapid, rapid flow of new ideas. But as you begin to work with that subject, you begin to find that the flow of ideas uh, begins to uh, slow and, uh, and even out. And uh, so the question then is, how do you begin to, to take this and to begin to capture it in a way that people can see and begin to build and refine. Uh, and so the approach that we've been experimenting with uh, is a, a combination of uh, uh, argument mapping and dialogue mapping. Uh, and this is a field which has a long, long history. The first examples of argument maps uh, that we've been able to find were in uh, the 19th century, in 1836, with uh, Watley producing a, a book of uh, uh, the logic of argument. Uh, didn't really uh, take off for quite a long period of time. It was popularized a bit more by uh, Wigmore in the 20th uh, century. And there are many pioneers in the field, uh, Bob Horn, uh, Tim Van Gelder, and others, uh, all working to explore how you can take arguments, uh, begin to break them down, uh, represent the thoughts in simple provisional building blocks, uh, and do that in a way that, uh, and so for example, the, the example that we have here, this is from a map that uh, it's, a, it's a short strand from a map on the Middle East peace process that we're working on at the moment with the Independent newspaper, uh, where one of the issues, uh, the question at the top, is um, uh, what, uh, what should be done about Jerusalem as part of any peace process. Uh, somebody has come to the site and suggested, in a brainstorming way, a, a potentially interesting way of resolving the tensions in that context would be to move the UN headquarters to Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, provided a reason for that, the economic stimulus to the region. So the idea is that you can, you can begin to break down the thought into its component parts uh, and then begin to assemble those parts in, their rela in, uh, in related ways. And you can do that uh, in a form that enables you to build just through simple combinations of those questions and uh, ideas and, uh, uh, and reasoning. Uh, into complex maps. So this, again, is a map we've been doing with the Independent about, the, uh, about what Obama should do next after the inauguration. Uh, and this is a map with over a 1,000 uh, elements uh, looking at different aspects of public policy. Uh, and it's a map that's been created by many people uh, coming, to the, uh, coming to the site, reading the arguments that others have put there, editing those arguments like Wikipedia, uh, where they see gaps, adding new issues that uh, need to be raised, new ideas for responding to those, uh, and uh, the reasoning supporting those. And you begin to iterate through this process until you have a comprehensive map of the subjects that are there. And you can do this in a way that uh, the community that's working on, uh, on this can uh, rate uh, the, uh, the salience of the different issues, the, the quality of the different uh, proposals that have been put forward in that context. Uh, and also the um, uh, and 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 also the strength of the reasoning. So in in, in some ways it becomes like a multi-dimensional poll of the community's thinking of uh, the issues that it's confronting. And by externalizing your thought in this way, sharing it with others, enabling others to build collaborative collaboratively with you on it, as that structure begins to change, those changes come back to you. So it, rather than us being constrained by the limits of holding seven to 12 ideas or thoughts in our short-term short memory, you begin to create a structure which you can explore uh, and see all of the thoughts from all of the different perspectives, all of the different frames that are uh, present within that, uh, within that context. Uh, and beneath the surface of that, each of the individual parts of this uh, map of the knowledge base that you're building can have as much detail as you need, need. so uh, you can have essay length uh, uh, descriptions that go into greater depth, images and video and, and, and things that, uh, to, to take people to that as well. But it's not enough just to simply begin to build these structures, you've got to find a way to distribute them so that as many people as possible can see and begin to input into the process. And so uh, what we've been doing with the independent is developing maps. Uh, these are interactive maps, which if you click on the different spheres, new spheres expand and open up. And you can explore the whole of the, uh, the, whole of the meta debate graph that we're, we're developing as part of this, just simply through clicking around the, the structure. But you can take these, take these maps. This is a map on climate change. Uh, 
uh, and you can see that it's uh, embedded on the, the Independence website, but also in the, uh, in the images around. It's embedded on uh, climate skeptic sites in, in Sweden, in, uh, US environmental activist sites, uh, uh, blogs in Brazil and New Zealand. And wherever anyone sees the map and sees gaps within the thinking, they're able to edit the map uh, and refine and continue to improve it. And those changes ripple across all of the different places where the maps are displayed. And the reason why this is so important was captured in one of uh, the observations by uh, Bill Joy of some microsystems, which I've appropriated and changed a little bit, but that, uh, that there are always more smart people outside government than within it. Uh, and the challenge is, how uh, can we use the internet to begin to take uh, this thought, this insight that's dispersed through the community, to find for each of the subjects that we're looking at, the experts who have the particular insight uh, uh, into a particular questions or have particular ideas that otherwise would not find a way to flow to the center. And experts in this case can be, uh, uh, in the context of uh, climate change, uh, uh, can be uh, somebody who's living next to a, a, a landfill site or somewhere where a windmill is, is being built. Expertise is if you have something significant that's novel, original, that's not in the context of what's already understood to contribute to that process. And this is also a way of uh, helping people to cope with the alienation and, uh, that we face with uh, the big scale of the uh, uh, of these uh, social problems that we face as a society uh, uh, today. Uh, because uh, if you try to tackle all of it, uh, none of us has a sufficient perspective, a sufficient insight to be able to really see the whole. But if we can use the internet to open up structures that people can see and explore, find gaps, build, refine, uh, then we find potentially got a mechanism to cope and address these. And the types, uh, the tangled problems that we confront require the coherent work of many eyes, many minds, and, uh, and many hands. Uh, so where are we in, re in relation to uh, the work that we've been doing? Uh, we've been fortunate uh, to work in a small way with uh, the White House and with, uh, uh, with Downing Street on the work that we're doing. Uh, and with uh, others in the field at the Open University and uh, MIT, uh, we're working on a project called Essence in the build-up to Copenhagen in, in 2009, where we're trying to apply this process uh, to uh, the task of mapping the, the salient issues around the choices that are faced uh, in Copenhagen in, in 2009, trying to give policymakers a different way to explore and see that subject as a whole. Uh, and so that process is underway. As a field, uh, there are uh, still plenty of challenges ahead. Uh, as tool makers, uh, we, there, are, there are two dimensions that uh, are critical for the field to develop. The first is uh, the things that we as tool makers put in the way of using the tools and trying to find a way to minimize the learning curve for that. The ability to take uh, is, is something which we're still learning. We've been iterating for a long period of time. We've still got a way to go. But we've seen as we've iterated that we're gradually drawing more people into the, into the process, and that's possible. The second dimension of the learning curve with this uh, is that um, uh, the actual process involves thinking hard. Uh, and I, I think there's an American comedian says that uh, if you make people think that you're, uh, they're thinking hard, uh, they'll love you. But if you really make them think hard, they'll hate you. Uh, and so th there's a, a challenge uh, as to whether the, the visual literacy that we've seen growing uh, from, uh, with mind mapping, coming into schools. When I, when I was at, at school a long, long time ago, I was probably the only person who was mind mapping at that time. Now my, my children are taught it at primary school as part of the, part of the curriculum. The challenge is whether we can see the kind of visual literacy that's involved in breaking argument uh, and subjects down in this way coming more to the fore in society so that it's understood to be a, an essential literacy in, in society, like reading uh, is seen to be, because the kinds of complex world that we're growing into needs tools of this kind that we and others are, are, are working on to, in order to enable us to grapple with and respond, uh, respond to that. Uh, at the moment, uh, it's, it's, it's a literacy that's more equivalent to musical literacy, where uh, some people are encouraged to do it, others take it to it more naturally. But it's not something that's, that's widely prevalent in society as, um, uh, as possible. And as speaking in, the, in, in an educational context, one of the things that 
I feel there's a huge opportunity is the, uh, is, is, is the way that we teach at universities and the work that we ask students to do in the universities and the subjects that are applicable to the, the types of things that I've been exploring. Uh, often, uh, students are producing individual isolated uh, work, less so these days, certainly, uh, which contribute nothing cumulatively to the directly to the, uh, the social uh, understanding and good. It's about uh, the individual's learning. Uh, there have been some experiments that have been starting to use uh, uh, student projects using wikis and being graded on those in a public way. And uh, we're starting to have uh, classes using the maps as ways of the students coming together around a subject, building their understanding of it, engaging with each other in a, in a deeper form of dia dialogue that the structured representation of the, uh, the images allows. And if we could take even a small proportion of the energy that is, flows into the work that undergraduates uh, uh, and, uh, are, are doing uh, and direct it outwards towards uh, cumulative public structures, we could en enrich not just the, the students and prepare them for this complex systemic world that, uh, that we face, but also begin to fill in the gaps on all of the subjects that we, uh, that we need to uh, address. Uh, so if I had one thing, I would say there's a huge cognitive surplus potentially there waiting to be released, uh, and we could use that uh, more efficiently and, uh, and effectively. Uh, so thank you. Uh, uh, that, that was the main thing that I wanted to cover, and if uh, you have any questions, I'd, I'd really appreciate them. Just before we pick up the questions, can I just say I think that that talk reflects back beautifully the theme of the conference, from dreams begins responsibility. I thought it was really quite interesting. So, uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, amazing piece of technology. I wondered if you were familiar with um, Syntegrity, which was brought out in the 60s by Stafford Beers, um, which was a face-to-face -face kind of uh, sharing of, um, of information through a, a community like this. And it was the, the process um, made sure that all parties met each other through a kind of mathematical um, uh, facilitation. Um, and what I was worried about was, um, at, at least there, there was this kind of physical, um, you, you kind of had some reassurance that those people were witnessing each other's understanding of things. And online, is there any way of, of knowing who's, you know, the, the, will there be that kind of follow through that people are looking at all, all those sides of the argument? Uh, there are several things there. Uh, the first. Uh, I think Stafford Beer's work obviously highly pertinent and, uh, and influenced the, the whole field in which I'm working. There are too many people really to have name-checked properly with that, but yes, it's very important. Uh, the second aspect of that is, uh, no matter how good uh, the work that you do online is, physical presence is always going to be an important part of that. Physical presence, particularly in the, in when you move towards coordinated action uh, uh, as well. And there is a real richness to dialogue between people in a physical space it's difficult to capture online. Uh, one of the things that we've learned over the last uh, couple of years while we've been working on this is, is that, and we've been thinking about that question, and actually we've just, uh, if, if you look on the site, it's live in a, in a quiet way at the moment, but a way of trying to enable that sense of physical presence in the context of the maps. So there's a way in which uh, you can see the map, you can see the stream of activity with images of the people who are doing the activity. They, people can converse with each other in threaded conversations around the map. As the changes to the map are occurring live, everyone sees those changes to the map. Uh, and so one of the things that we're going to be experimenting with over the, over the next few months is this sense of trying to gather people in this space online, but with that number not being limited by any physical uh, capacity of, the, uh, of, of a physical space, and to see whether we can really begin to get that kind of rich interaction in addition to the, uh, the more forensic aspect of, of uh, breaking down the structure and working with that, that structure. So uh, it, it's an excellent question and certainly one of the, one of the challenges ahead for us. Okay. 
Hello, thanks very much. Uh, uh, that was really interesting. I wanted to pick up on the point about harnessing undergraduate students' work. I'm very keen on this. Um, and I'm involved in lots of projects at Chester, which are on a local level. But really, I think what you're talking about is more of a sort of national and international level. Um, people have talked to me about the sort of ethical issues of involving students where the work is being assessed. I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that. Ethical issues around the assessment in, in what sense? Well, in that you, you're requiring them to do this if it's being assessed. Uh, and should you be uh, requiring them to, to make that uh, effort in that way, I suppose? I don't have a problem with this with myself, but other people do, so that's yes. why. I, I can imagine that there, there's a cloud of ethical issues around, uh, around that which, which we could explore. We require students to do things as, as part of the contract of, uh, of, of being there. So I suppose in one sense, whether you're doing that as uh, private, more isolated work or whether you're doing it as public collaborative uh, work uh, is, uh, is, is immaterial in, 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 that, in that sense of, uh, of there being a requirement anyway. There are certainly some issues um, uh, around it. Uh, the more that you make the work public uh, and the more deeply people begin to collaborate, how do you begin to identify the, the individual contributions is certainly another uh, factor that's relevant, which brings into play the different frames that apply in a university context as to what the purpose of the education uh, is. Uh, from, uh, from my perspective, uh, but I would say that, and it's one, one perspective, the, uh, uh, if you're releasing this cognitive surplus and channeling it towards social benefit, uh, that seems to be an inherently good thing in and in of itself. And so I'm in favour of it, but uh, I recognise there, there are different ways of looking at it as well. I'm afraid we have to stop at that point, because I know there's a lot of people still with questions, and perhaps you can talk to David afterwards. Can we thank David again for a fascinating talk.